This is ridiculous. All we ever get for loot and rewards is gold and magic items. Doesn't doesn't anybody else feel like it gets old and boring after a while? Yeah, tell me about it. I now have four different magic swords I can use. I'll need to hire a caddy to wheel around my sword bag pretty soon. Yeah, I feel like somebody should tell our stupid dungeon master that when he hands out too much gold and magic items, it ceases to feel special. I mean, it just feels like mundane and boring. Yeah, I mean, we we have tons of gold and nothing to spend it on. Doesn't, doesn't our dungeon master know that the people who designed Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition economy totally screwed the pooch? Indeed. Perhaps we should compile a list of non-gold and non-magic item loot and rewards that we would like to get from our dungeon master. Yeah, 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 it'll be like making a Christmas list. This, this is so exciting. Welcome to the DM Layer. I'm Luke Hart, and I've been a Dungeon Master since high school. On this channel, I give practical Dungeon Master advice that you can implement at your game table. And just as our beloved D&D players and the intro skit indicated, today we'll be compiling a list of 15 non-monetary and non-magic item rewards that Dungeon Masters can give to their players during their campaigns. Because here's the deal, showering your players with crap tons of gold and magic items isn't the only way to reward them in the game. In fact, in some cases, it might be even less than desirable to reward them this way. Take gold. Sure, at low levels, they can't get enough of it because it's so scarce. But if you've ever been in a campaign that got past like level five or so, many times you discover that your players begin to have more money than they know what to do with. Especially if you roll loot from the tables in the Dungeon Master Guide, which I personally do. And then you, as the Dungeon Master, have to create things for them to spend their money on, such as properties, strongholds, and consumables, which isn't a bad thing in and of itself. In fact, those are really cool things that players probably love but it does create more work for you as the dungeon master. But I guess that's probably a tangent for another day and another video. Point is, showering players with more and more gold has its own issues. And then magic items. There are two problems with giving out buckets of magic items to your players from my point of view. First, it increases player power, which in turn forces you, the Dungeon Master, to increase the challenge of all the encounters, which is again, more work for the Dungeon Master. Are we beginning to see a pattern here? Oh, and let's not forget that many Dungeon Masters use modules. It's one thing to increase the challenge of homebrew adventures based on your player's level of power. However, do you really want to have to rework most of the encounters in a module because you unwittingly dumped dozens of magic items at your player's feet, not realizing the effect it would have on the game. Also, once your players have tons of magic items, they stop feeling special. Scarcity increases the desirability of commodities. Once something is easily obtainable and everyone has tons of them, they're no longer as cool to have. Once upon a time before I was born, it was amazing to have a television set because not everybody had them. But now everyone has at least one, if not several in their homes. Having a TV is no longer special and exciting. It's expected and normal. If you give your players too many magic items, they can start to feel ho-hum boring. Okay, so now that I've made the case for why only giving gold and magic items to players presents a variety of issues, and perhaps convinced you that you may want to consider rewarding players with other things, we're going to dive into that juicy top 15 list I promised you in the title. But first, I wanna let all my patrons and YouTube members know that I'm going to be doing a special giveaway for you all. Four of you will have the opportunity to play in a D&D one-shot with me as your dungeon master. You'll be receiving a message on Patreon or in the members-only YouTube community feed with a link to where you can go sign up to be entered into the giveaway. So please keep an eye out for that. Now, this giveaway is only open to my patrons or YouTube members. It's my way of thanking them for supporting what we're doing around here. However, if you're not a patron or YouTube member and you want to get in on the action, you can check out my Patreon at the link down below or click the join button right below this video to learn about becoming a YouTube member. I should probably also mention there are lots of regular ongoing benefits my patrons and members enjoy, such as a monthly voice chat hangouts, access to a private VP Discord server, and even shout outs in videos and live streams. Speaking of which, I want to give a quick shout out to Mr. Pages, Wayne B, The Colonel, Zenelon, Wayne Browser Jr., and Joe M for their generosity. You guys all rock. 
And now that I've jabbered on for quite long enough, how about we get on to that list? A list that I want to mention many of my viewers helped generate ideas for in a community post I did about a month or two back, so thanks. Number one, lore and knowledge. These are good rewards for your players for a couple of reasons. First, if you dispense lore and knowledge in such a way that it helps your players in future quests and adventures, they will experience the direct benefit of it. Second, it gives you, the Dungeon Master, a way to make your world more immersive and real to your players, little by little. Just make sure you're spacing out the lore and knowledge throughout your campaign. I strongly recommend against huge information dumps. Those can easily be boring and players might just zone out. Short and sweet is the name of the game. Number two, cool but mostly useless items. Come on, we all know that some of our players' favorite items are those fun and quirky things that are mostly worthless but are great for role playing. For instance, a sword that squeals in pain, mocking the enemies every time it does damage or a small gelatinous cube in a jar that doesn't do much of anything except dissolve whatever you put in the jar. Now you know your players will find cool uses for that. Number three, plot relevant items. What I like to do is give the players things like maps, journal entries, or letters from the big bad to their lieutenants. And then these items include information in them that helps drive the plot forward. The map shows enemy locations. The journal hints at the big bad's weakness. A letter reveals part of the big bad's master plan, stuff like that. These things also provide awesome adventure hooks for your players as well. Number four, NPC contacts, allies, and friends. When your players help that wizard find the component for a rare spell, bring back the village dead priest from the dead, or rescue the Baron's daughter from wicked kidnappers, they make allies and friends in the game. Allies and friends that may someday in the future return the favor to the players, who wouldn't want the king to owe them a debt of gratitude after all. Number five, pets and followers. Now, these are basically NPCs that adventure with the players. For instance, Maggie from my Wonder Panda campaign had a pet squirrel that she was particularly fond of. Until some kobolds heinously murdered it, of course. And my other player, Matt, had a whole string of followers at one point. An alchemist at first, and then when he died, he found a homunculus, N124. And then I'm pretty sure when N124 died, there was another. Now, sure, I heartlessly murdered all of his followers, but the point is that Matt thoroughly enjoyed having them right up until the point where his dungeon master kind of broke his heart. Yeah, I I'm a fairly evil dungeon master. You probably don't want to play D&D with me. Number six, learning new skills and languages. Now, these are cool rewards, but also powerful ones, so pace yourself. Knowing languages is fun and useful in the game, but if your players learn them all in a week of game time, that is probably a bit much. And being proficient with everything, probably not a good idea. As a dungeon master, remember to keep game balance in mind as well. Number seven, trinket loot. Okay, this is basically the mostly worthless junk your players find lying around the game world, but that they absolutely love for some reason or another. Take the claws, teeth, and skulls of enemies. Why do my players collect that crap? I probably will never know, but I give it to them like candy. Costumes, jewelry, exotic food, puzzle boxes, sextants, hourglasses, oh, and, and dead bodies. For some reason, players seem to love carrying around dead bodies. Don't ask, just, just roll with it. Number eight. Boons, Blessings, and Charms. These are listed in the Dungeon Master Guide after all of the other treasure and are actually really cool. Blessings and Charms are basically temporary magical benefits PCs can receive. They're great because you can give your players something really cool, but because it has a limited number of uses, there's less probability that it'll unbalance the game, if that's something you're looking to avoid, which, which I usually am. Boons are available at epic levels, but how many groups ever get that far? Things are probably already unbalanced around level 15 anyway, so why not just throw that stuff in a little early? Number nine, properties. In my Ancient Dragon Patreon game, my players recently came into possession of Sweet Tooth Bakery for their work in convincing a local rat king to take his subject out of the city and become river rats because, you know, better food and more fresh air. And of course, since we're running an Acquisitions Incorporated game, my players also have a franchise headquarters. And a little while back, I actually made a video about running an Acquisitions Incorporated style of game and the benefits of doing so if you're interested in checking that out. Not only are these properties cool for your players to have, but they also introduce unique opportunities for the Dungeon Master. First, it gives players something to spend their gold on, 
renovating the building to increase sales, for instance. And it also gives them another aspect of gameplay to engage in. And they give the dungeon master hooks. Oh no, a rival baker is stealing your share of the market. Let's go take care of that. Number 10, mundane weapons and armor that look cool and have interesting stories behind them. A suit of scale mail made from rainbow colored scales that has been worn by every elf in the gray leaf lineage. An orc hide cloak worn by a famous orc slayer. You get the idea. Number 11, broken items. What, what, really? Yes, just give them to your players and tease them with promises of awesome power if they're ever able to repair them. Scatter necessary parts all across the game world. Make them hit level 20 before they find them all. You know, evil and devious stuff like that. Number 12, a brand new car or a horse or a wagon or a ship. You know, whatever works best for your game world. Once I gave five hippogriffs to my Sword Coast guard players and then spent the next few months shooting them full of arrows until only one survived. But I'll tell you what, Nigel loves that hippogriff. Named him Pegasus, actually. Number 13, a land and a title. Oh yeah, saddle your players up with grand old titles. The Duke of Yonderburg and vast tracts of land full of serfs who look to them for protection. Talk about the gift that keeps on giving. Help, there's a dragon in the area. Oh no, the king is increasing the taxes and now I can't afford to send Sally to college. Number 14, faction favor. All of my D&D games feature different factions or organizations operating in the same area as the adventuring party. And the player's actions can affect those factions' attitudes toward them either favorably or unfavorably. For instance, if the Sword Coast Guard breaks the siege on Gauntlet Hall, they are both increasing their favor with the Lords of Waterdeep and decreasing their favor with Lord Paxton. And then basically how much favor the players have with a faction determines whether the faction is neutral towards them, inclined to help them with small favors, or actively sending assassins or other problems their way. I'm pretty sure the Dungeon Master Guide has a bit in it about favor, and I'm also pretty sure I stole it and tweaked it just a little bit to suit my own purposes. However, I may do a future video dedicated to my faction favor system if folks would find that useful. Number 15, stuff related to their backstories. For example, Donna from my Hand of Light group had several brothers and sisters who were carried off from her hometown by raiders, and she's been spending her entire life trying to track them down. Over the course of the campaign, she is able to find them because I wove that plot thread into the rest of the campaign's plot, rescue them, and reunite most of her family. I guarantee you that my player Anna felt way more rewarded by accomplishing that than getting any amount of gold or number of magic items. Let me know the special ways you reward your D&D players. Next week, I'll tell you the story of the self-detonating bard, but until then, click right here to learn how to make the perfect boss fight. And until next time, let's play D&D.